What? DNA mutation? You better lock in and buckle up because you're in for another creepy and scary TikTok reaction video. I'm Jet Ski Chuck, and on these dark waters, you better keep your head on a straight swim. You don't know what's going to come at you on these dark waters. Hyper mode, activate. Turbos 3, 7, and 4, unite. Hyper mode, engage. I use a... They cooking. What are those bells and statues? Those Tartarian buildings. They they trying to cook on this one. What's going on? Kind of looks like the Egyptian hieroglyph a little bit. But man, that last video. Man, they are breaking stuff. Yeah, what? So this is galaxy brain cells. Everything is connected. Everything is connected. And that Honeycrisp apple was bussing. All right, man. We got a little bit kind of off track. There was so much happening on those older videos. Let him come. Slow through. down to screenshot. They said, slow down the screenshot. What's up with those bells? Somebody poisoned the water hole. Yeah, these buildings, there's something up with these buildings. They're not telling us the truth. What is that? What is this? That Buddha?
riding a griffin? That griffin kind of reminded me of that. What was on the Tartaria? The, the Tartarian flag. That griffin? This thing is riding? I, this thing looks massive and it's. Made out of copper. Is this the same thing they made the Statue of Liberty out of? What is this? These buildings. Who designed these buildings? Starfort, Stoth. How does it all correlate? I need answers. This is way too Let much. Him cook. Way too much information. Finally found some saw blade marks in this ancient tank. Ready or not, here I come. They had some so sort of machine. You can see the blade lines as it was cutting through. And it's not just straight, it's kind of concave. Perfectly smooth. That's how they cut the insides. So smooth in there. It's the same thing I've seen in Peru. Ramses the Great? Where's that? Where's these statues at? He's saying they're using technology now? Oh, this is getting good. Where's my notes at? We need to research Ramses and the machinery cutting. Ramsey statue. All right. Same machines. Accurate depiction of the Native Americans of the United States is beginning to unfold. Because history has been told to us by Europeans with a European point of view, we have. What is this giant bell? Where could this bell be? Is that the same one? All right, guys, we're getting a lot through at us, man. But one thing I'm definitely interested in is this bell. The die Glock is an amazing device that was being developed by the Nazis during World War II. This die Glock, again, technology that they learned about through an advanced civilization that they were in communication with through the Thule Society. Thule, T-H-U-L-E, Thule Society. They were using psychics to channel information from an advanced alien race and they were taking this knowledge and then turning it into actual real workable technology and so they had this thing in germany called the henge where they had these gigantic stone pillars in the, in the shape of a henge and they had the die glock in the middle it looked like an uh, an acorn a ufo type but an acorn shape here, ufo and it had these multi counterclockwise spinning pieces on it that was spinning all different ways. The ultimate purpose of it seems to have been some type of time travel. And this thing at one point, based on eyewitness accounts, it's turned on and activated and it, it disappeared from the hinge. It was seen like, I forget how many decades later, I think it crashed somewhere in Virginia or something, according to these accounts. It, it reappeared later and it crashed somewhere, I believe, in the Americas.
Did you know that Lot's wife didn't become a pillar of salt just because she looked back? The real reason will surprise you. Genesis 19 tells the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his family are rescued by two angels who order them to leave the city before God unleashes his wrath. They are also told not to look back or stop. The Bible mentions that Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. But in fact, the Hebrew verb in that verse is very similar to look back. Jesus in Luke 17:31 says that on the day of the Lord, whoever is in the field should not turn back to anything. In verse 32, he says to remember Lot's wife, indicating that she not only looked back, but also tried to turn back. But because she became a pillar of salt, in Deuteronomy 29.23, it says that Sodom and Gomorrah became a wilderness of salt and brimstone from heaven. In addition to sulfur and fire also fell salt, and it is likely that when she returned near the site, her body was covered by these three elements. She became a statue of salt for disobedience and not for punishment from God. Dang, are they trying to say that's that's her? How did they come to that conclusion? Yo. Those remind me of those cathedrals. This is demon face syndrome I've been hearing about. They're saying it's everywhere. He looked like he was straight out the movie Men in Black, man. Yeah, y'all better be careful, man. Called the Rill. They come up from underground different spots all over the world. There's a one to one and a half foot tall one. That's the real type one. Uh, the type ones are covered in red diamond shaped scales. Real type ones are real dumb. Little dragons, those are the real type one. These lizards have a unique biological property of their body. The lizards have a, what's called a thromboscus. It's an ejectable brain and spinal column. The small ones they use to drone people because the proboscis on young lizard type ones, they're small enough to go into an eye and not ruin the eye. This top cap thing on the top of their head comes out. They can do this once in their life. It pulls their spinal column along with it. The humans would have to be restrained or unconscious. The thing Yo, that reminds me of Earthworm Jim. 
you know, because he'll jump all in and out, you know? How many of y'all remember Earthworm Jim? Thing squiggles in through the eye. It uh, does a spiral around the optic nerve all the way to a certain point, and it's driven there by taste. And they, they said once it gets there, it has the taste of butterscotch. It then starts what they call the spinal cord stuff comes out of the spinal cord, and it's everything that the lizard is. The lizard's whole body is dead, and it can't go back in. It's one way. The juice that's in the spinal cord gets excreted out of the tip of this thing. They're parasitic cells. The parasitic cells go into the brain. The old person's consciousness is gone. The body is absolutely, totally dominated, and the lizard is smarter as a human. Over time, it'll develop a rash, it'll, it'll lose its hair. And they're actually deficient. They're, they're dumber than the original person. And they mimic human behavior, and it knows that its life is dependent on it mimicking human behavior, so it does really well. Even with other animals, it, it's smart enough to instinctively mimic the animal's behavior. The drones of 100 years ago erased any existence of these real lizards from like uh, Egyptian carvings on walls, they would smash them. Or books that had anything in them about them, they would burn them. What are these real talking about? We got to get to the bottom of this. It reminded me of Earthworm Jim. You remember the famous game on Sega? That was my game. Earthworm Jim? Were they trying to tell us something? Huh? Y'all let me know in the comments below. This is Dark Waters 9 now. The days of Noah repeated. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the end of the world. The reason as to why this is, is because the fallen Anunnaki, which are fallen angels, they descended into mankind and started to do genetic splicing where they created a new hybrid species of humans. And that was how you get the whole story of the giants and so forth. Now when the flood happened, that was the end of the world at that time, and Yah killed them off because that sea was evil and wicked and started to pillage and rape mankind, chop down trees, hurt animals and beasts and so forth. And then you see that repeating itself because the same thing continued to happen. There were giants well after the flood, like Goliath, the land of Canaan was full of giants, and so forth. So the genetic splicing continued to happen and more angels continued to descend. And you can see where they was made evident because you see a group of people that are contrary to nature. They have the DNA of Neanderthal and then the Solvents. And they met these species. Dang, it said Moses' hand turned as white as snow. And that was biblical what? Leopard? Did y'all see that? They move they be moving quick on these TikToks, y'all. I seen continue to happen and more angels continue to to the sin. And you can see where they was made evident because you see a group of people that are contrary to nature. They have. Where are they getting this information? Seeing. And you this is this is for entertainment purposes only. You can see where they was made evident because you see a group of people that are contrary. What? DNA mutation? Wow. To nature, they have the DNA of Nyan. Neanderthal 
and then the Sovans, and they met these species in the Caucasus Mountains, and they was in the mountains because they was burning in the sun. And that's how you get Esau meaning red, because Esau, which was actually an albino, mixed his lineage with Japheth, and they became one nation and one people from that day forward, which is stated in the Bible. And when they mixed, they created this new species of humans. And these people burn red in the sun because the seed is unnatural and the sun burns them. They're also red because of the Malahara, the root chakra, in which they was primitive and trying to figure out how to survive. All of this is in the Bible, and it makes... We had an ancestor here, a cousin. It wasn't homo sapien sapien like us, but I believe that we are directly still linked to that lineage, that bloodline. And this was a, a being that was here, a hominid, that had bigger brain, we could tell because we found the skull, we found the bones, this is not a mystery, a bigger brain, um, and I think that they probably were, had a bigger pineal gland because of a larger brain, probably were more in tune with the Schumann resident, the frequency of the earth, with nature, in tune with how to operate within nature. Ley lines. The frequency of the earth, ley lines. And more of a green type of a society. And I truly believe that they were very much smarter than us, not technologically, but spiritually. I believe they had access to the magnetite crystals in their brains. More of their DNA was probably plugged in. So whereas not now, we rely purely on technology as homo sapiens sapiens. And without technology, we're completely lost, including myself. I mean, if GPS goes down, I'm lost. Okay, forget about it. I think they had the capability of navigating based on magnetic fields, maybe even telekinesis, telepathy, all of those things that we should be operating in right now because we still have it in us. We've just been unplugged. And that unplugging happened about 200,000 years ago when a race of beings came to this planet named the Anunnaki. We call them the Anunnaki. They have various different names. And they began to genetically tinker with the hominids, our cousins, until they got to the Homo sapiens sapiens, which is actually us. Our brains became smaller. Our pineal glands became smaller. Our, our DNA was unplugged and called now junk DNA, but it's not really junk. And we've kind of been disconnected from nature in a way through this genetic modification that occurred about 200,000 years ago. And modern science has confirmed that a genetic modification happened to us about 200,000 years ago, but they don't, know, they don't know by who. Well, the ancient tablets clearly say exactly who it was. And one of the things you'll learn about Anunnaki is there's hybrids on Earth Human and Anunnaki hybrids. They look like us because they're half human. And they made sure in the genetics that they were going to look like human. And these are the ones we call Nephilim. If you look at some of the ancient texts, you'll discover that humans were living for thousands of years. Well, what happened? The Anunnaki, these Atlantean beings that came here in the distant past, they disconnected our DNA. That's what you have called now junk DNA. It's not junk, guys. It's unplugged DNA. Chromosome number two in the human body was taken out, fused together, and two telomere caps were put on each end. These telomere caps, they store buff. Telomere caps, huh? Let's write it down. All right, y'all had to get a pen. I keep losing my pens. All right, y'all, I had to get a pen. I keep losing my pens. All right, I got a good one. Telomere caps, huh? Telomere. DNA. All right. Let's see what they got to say. Of material when your cells and DNA replicate it allows information to not be lost in a transference because you know your body's consistently regenerating over and over again but when the buffer material in these caps run out that's when your body starts the death process so we were capped they put a cap on us we've been genetically modified did you know that the human sapien sapien man is made up of so they nerfed us basically that's crazy but we're going to get to the bottom of it. 22 different types of alien species. Now, of course, the Palladians, from what I understand, they actually did create not only the, what we call the Nordic aliens. I believe that they're the same. You know what I mean? But also, they had a lot to do with some of the indigenous in the Americas and, of course, Asia.
like the Japanese, believe it or not. But there's 22 different types. These are the two major ones that are actually fought for power of Earth. There's many archangels that are both descendants of both these lineages, believe it or not. Gabriel is one over here. Michael the archangel is the other one for the Anunnaki, believe it or not. I want you folks to know that we come from Homo sapiens, but there's different types that we all evolve from. Of course, geographically, we come from different areas, right? You got the Nordic Palladians, colder areas, obviously, for their skin types. And then there's different types. Of course, the Anunnaki, you have all the way down to like South Africa, all the way to Egypt, all the way to certain parts of um, Middle East, and don't forget Europe. Anunnaki's, that's true. But there's all different types, my brothers and sisters. Now, I want to share with you that I've actually actual projected out of my body, and I've met full form Palladians. They are very, very well mannered, very polite people. And when they came to me, they came to me this way and they grabbed the bottom of my elbows. That's how they greeted me. They greeted me, that's how they, they greet. That's how they, we shake hands, they greet from cupping the bottom of each other's elbows. That's how the Palladians greet. Now they came to me in full form. And I wanna share with you that everything that I'm teaching you is very, very true. And there will be more to come for you folks. I want you to know that I do come more from the lineage of this, but I also have Syrian and I have a little bit of Palladian. I've actually lived in all these different constellations. That's how old my spirit is. I am not the only one that's like this. There's many of us here on earth and we're here to raise the vibrations. We are anchoring light here on earth. I happen to have multiple kids that have autism in my family. Um, on my mom's side of the family, there's probably at least 20 kids that have autism on my mom's side alone. So it is, it is a DNA thing, it is a spiritual thing, it is genealogy. Now that's another thing I want to talk about you folks. It's really important to study who you are and your genealogy. Forget about everything else. Study who you are. All of us have Anunnaki in us. Some of, us, some of us have um, 12 to 40 strand DNA template. Our DNA is so distorted, but we hire spiritual beings, right? Each strand of our DNA is from a different alien race. So this means we have so many different levels of consciousness. This has been done in laboratories. They've taken DNA. They... All right, we're going to stay on this DNA topic. But, you know, it's, I don't know, man. It's, it's definitely interesting to hear. It's just that. We are in an enclosed ecosystem. So as far as the Palladians living in a Sector 9, Nebula 5, you know, it's... They would have to be on these waters. They would have to be beyond the ice wall on some uncharted waters for any of this to have any type of validity. Uh, they've analyzed a person's thought patterns through caps that they put on with electrodes and they've got them looking at photos photos that show people getting murdered then a photo of a field of flowers then a photo of somebody hugging a child and then a photo of somebody getting beat up and they analyze those thought patterns in a laboratory and this is how they learn this so at specific times when you're feeling the, the mode of fear the DNA there's a frequency that oscillates over your DNA it covers a very wide a band and it, co it covers less of your DNA. In a high frequency love mode, the frequency is oscillates much faster and they're hence much closer together and more of the frequency is touching your DNA strand, which means you're operating at a high frequency. This is real science. Now I'm talking about real peer reviewed quantum physics and quantum mechanics, okay? It's so now because I'm doing that and I'm feeling this love frequency, this vibration and happiness in the meditation, I'm now operating at a high level. Now I'm syncing up with the Christ consciousness. The Christ consciousness is gonna carry that photonic or that, that particle energy to sync up with the universal consciousness on a quantum entanglement. And now I'm quantum entangled directly with the flower of life, which is the face of God. Hey, what's up, y'all? We back today with another one. 
a quantum entanglement. Huh. There's definitely some meat to be eaten here. I like to do what is called eat the meat and spit out the bones. And there is some meat here. Spreading the positive vibes. That's what it's all about. We'll be talking about star seeds because they're not telling you guys the truth. These star seeds came from the sky, just like the Anunnaki. You have many different races on this planet. Y'all looking up for the aliens, and they've been here the whole time. So now we're about to go into it and break it all down. Start off with the Great Mother Dragon. She is responsible for a lot of creations. This would be your Alpha Draconian. Alpha means beginning. Omega means the end. We're going to look them up. We got Draconian. Yeah, they are the original Earthborn. A lot of us used to like Yu-Gi-Oh growing up and didn't know why. The dragon was the most dominant. Then you will have the feline or the lyrans. They came from Lyra. And then. Hold on, so the Thundercats are real? And it's the Blue Avians. You ever seen somebody that looked just like a bird? They are from the star system Pegasus. They have their tribe set up all over Earth. Thoth from Egypt is a Blue Avian. And you have your insectoid. Out of all the different species, they will reproduce the fastest. They create giant cocoons or beehives and they hatch from them. They are from Andromeda. And then you have your dogs, like Anubis here. He is from Canis Major. Some may call it the dog star. This would be your brightest star in the sky. That's why Anubis is connected with the afterlife. You have 24 different species that came into our galaxy. I only named a few, it'll take me all day. But this is where you will get your 24 elders from. With 12 being evil and 12 being good, creating. I've heard about the 24 or 12 elders before. That's not the first time. Who are the 12 elders or the 24? In balance. Now, a lot of us just think we are one star seed. We have anywhere from one to 24 different species inside of us. This was all genetic manipulation. They implant genetic memory inside of our brain. With this genetic memory, it will make us carry out their duties. It's like a program that's been put inside of your body. This is why some humans have more chromosomes than others. You have 22 with Y and X making it 24. So to break down the Anunnaki, it's a council of 24 different species. Anunnaki means the ones who came down. These are the elders who came down. The Anunnaki will be your galactic federation. Now above the galactic federation, it's the council of nine. And they have more power or say so over the Anunnaki. So somewhere down your family line, your ancestor genetics was manipulated. And your council of nine will be cleaning up all the bad genetics inside of your body. And they would do this by using primordial energies. This was all a test for the 24 races. They were supposed to ascend spiritually, but they fell in love with the physical world. Now all invaders must go. It's time for us to deal with our own species, the human race. If y'all haven't realized it, they turned the energy up on the sun. By doing this, anything that is not earthborn must leave our solar system. It's time for us to take our powers back. Peace. In May of 2019, host... Hey, that's Dark Waters 9 for real. What y'all think about that? Let me know in the comments below. We're going to keep this rolling on these Naki waters. of open minds, Regina Meredith, led a team of researchers with the help of Gaia 
to see if they could investigate a series of giant bones belonging to a man named Luigi Muscas on the island of Sardinia. In his book titled The Giants of Sardinia, he boasts pictures of very large human bones and DNA results done by the University of Padova in Italy. The remains tested showed an O blood type, RH negative. This is interesting because Sardinia is one of the few places in the world with the highest concentration of the RH negative O blood type today. Luigi believes this genetic lineage was the result of their ancestors of giant stature. If this is true, is it possible we can find more evidence of this DNA lineage throughout the ancient text? What will this reveal about the true history of humanity in relation to an ancient race of giants and possibly their interactions with Homo sapiens sapiens? When you look at the evidence of a genetically modified human civilization, the smoking gun that we are a genetically engineered species is the staggering number of genetic defects we have. Whenever you genetically engineer an organism, you create genetic defects. Naturally occurring organisms have very few genetic defects. Humans have over 4,000, and we are finding new ones every year. We have far, far more genetic defects than any other species on the planet. Darwin himself said that, We have all the earmarks of a domesticated animal. Domesticated animals, such as cattle, poultry, and pets, are riddled with genetic defects because humans have selectively bred them for hundreds of generations to get them in their current forms. Chimpanzees and humans. Also, there is only one chromosome of difference between us and chimpanzees. We have one less chromosome than they do because chimpanzee chromosomes 2 and 3 have been fused together in us. There is no natural process that can cause chromosomes to fuse in this way but it is a common practice in genetic engineering. I don't know, man. I, I think there's a certain... I don't think that we necessarily had full control over um, being able to customize humans like that. Um... I believe it just was a mother and father, and that's as far as it went. Um, but then again, I don't know. Y'all talking this Naki, and this, you know, were they using alchemy? Was it some type of scientific process where, you know, they had them in a alien ship with all these different machines? I don't know, but it just seems a little too far-fetched for me to... You know, I would have to see some type of, I don't know, some ancient tablets that show some type of alchemy or magic depicted on it for me to be like, ah, this might have a little bit of validity, but it's not, you know, it definitely is interesting. And we're going to continue going on these waters, but just giving you my stance and where I'm looking at, it's just... You would you would have, you know, a whole bunch of seven foot, you know, looking gorgeous people if that was the case, you know, if they were that good at manipulation, DNA manipulation. But that's not the case. You know, it's, it's so much powers you can get. I believe they were making humaculi or, or monstrosities is what it could have been. They were making pure monstrosities that didn't really have a soul. The soul didn't really transfer well. And that's when they stuck with these monstrosities, these beasts. Maybe that's where Cyclops came. I don't know. I'm just trying to piece, the, piece it together on these dark waters. But let's keep going. They saw that the daughters of men were beauty, so they took them to wife. By the way, in sort of the Bible translation, they say, the fallen angels saw that the daughters of men were beauty, and they took them to wife. And another thing, if the fallen angels are so good, or the Naki are so good with DNA manipulation or whatever, why are they falling in such love with the human women? 
they couldn't. That was something they ain't never seen before. That was God's creation. They say if you want a virtuous one, who can find a virtuous one on Proverbs? Who can find one? More precious than rubies, you know? You got to pray for one. That's the only way you're going to get one. You can't DNA manipulate one or create one. You know, oh, I want to create a virtuous woman. Let me do the DNA knocky splurge. No, I don't work like that. There's a divine intervention that takes place. But we're going to keep going on these, you know, the DNA CRISPR, you know, we're going to get down to the bottom of it. But there's some truth on these waters that we getting at. For entertainment purposes only, do your own research on everything. What is a fallen angel? They who descended. And not only in the Bible, you find this absolutely clear again in the book of Enoch. Enoch gives even the names of 36 of these extraterrestrial figures, which say, we want to go down there, we want to have sex, we want to do this, even if it's, it's against what the Lord, the Lord is the commander of the spaceship, says. And they had sex, and the result was some different creatures and giants and all these things. In the Bible, this race of giants are called the Anakim. They are mentioned in the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites. According to the book of Numbers, Anak was a forefather of the Anakim. The Bible describes them as very tall descendants of the Nephilim, the daughters of men and sons of gods, and also fallen ones who existed before the deluge. The term Anunnaki has been translated in various forms and is the source of much controversy. Renowned author Zachariah Sitchin Q90 form. Boy, we're learning, y'all. That's that Q90 form. Am I saying it right? Q90? Q90? Q90 form. Your boy gonna learn how to read it. Watch. Claims he has translated them as those from heaven came. Many scholars claim their interpretation is those of royal blood or those of princely offspring. One friend and colleague of mine was Lawrence Gardner. He was tracking the whole significance of certain bloodlines going back into Mesopotamia. I was encountering exactly the same information coming in to my investigations of an alien presence on this planet and throughout the solar system. We found that we met at sort of a same point, and that was that in Mesopotamia, that all of the Anunnaki were supposed to be reptilian. And that the reptilian biology had blood that was dominated by copper. And that they literally... DNA is a storage medium. In other words, it's a hard drive. This is peer-reviewed science, by the way, guys. One gram of DNA, which is enough to put a little tiny drop on the tip of your finger, can store 700 terabytes of data. Zeros and ones that make your phone work and make your computer work. Zeros and one bits of data, zeros and ones, can be stored on DNA. We're walking USB drives, literally. Inside of your body right now, you can store 13.5 billion years of data. Ironically, that's how old the universe is. You literally have all the information stored in your body from the beginning of time until this very moment inside of you. So when people say the universe is in you, it's not just a figure of speech. Like the universe is really in you. Everything that was here from the beginning is here right now. Nothing's been added, nothing's been removed due to the law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be destroyed, it can only be transformed. You're just here right now in this particular form at this particular moment, but all the information in your DNA will go back if you had the capability of decoding it, will allow you to find this out. This is why, and some of you here know that I talk a lot about the Anunnaki, these Atlantean beings that came here in the distant past and genetically modified the existing hominid. They didn't create people, they modified people. He said they didn't create people, they modified people. What does he mean by literally modifying? Do they teach them makeup, you know? You, you, use, you, you smash these two rocks together, you get makeup, or was, it, was there some alchemy, or some magic? You know, huh? 
Interesting. If you really analyze the text, and I'm not just talking about Sumerian text, you have to go into a, several different versions of text. The Enuma Elish and Seven Tablets of Creation, the Atra Asis Epic, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You go into uh, the Emerald Tablets. You discover that there was already a hominid here and it was genetically modified. That was our cousin before Homo sapiens existed. What did they do to us to make us into this slave race to do the work for them? They disconnected our DNA. That's what you have called now junk DNA. It's not junk, guys. It's unplugged DNA. Why did they unplug it? Because our cousins, unlike you've been taught, were way smarter than us. I'm not talking technologically smarter. I'm talking about spiritually smarter. More in tune with nature, more in tune with the universe, more in tune with the planet itself, the Schumann resonant frequency of the earth. They had bigger brains proven because we found the skulls all over the planet. They had uh, probably because of bigger brains, most likely had bigger pineal glands, which is your spiritual antenna. All humans right now, we have billions of magnetite crystals in our brains. We don't even use them. They probably had access to their magnetite crystals, which is what turtles use to navigate the oceans to come back to where they're going to lay their eggs. And birds, they flock to the south and the winter and so forth, all using the magnetic field. Well, we have the same capability, but right now we've been disconnected from using that. If a tsunami comes inland, before it even hits, all the wild animals run to the mountains and the hills. You never see wild animals getting swept away by a tsunami. We've been disconnected. You know, our DNA has been disconnected. Our consciousness has been reduced. They've already scientifically proven and found out that a worship gene was embedded into the human genome. They can call it the worship gene, or what if it was called something else? You know, what's what's really the definitive who who defines that? But don't worry, we're going to dive into that. We're going to dissect and chop that all the way up. What if I told you that the cartoon we all know as the Thundercats was actually based on a real ancient comic? What if I told you that the cartoon we all know as the Thundercats was actually based on a real ancient cosmic war that took place between the Lyrans and the Draco Reptilians? Lyrans are cat-like extraterrestrials. They actually depicted them all through the hieroglyphics of ancient Kemet. The ancient Kemetic goddess Sekhmet was actually from the Lyran constellation. The Kemetic goddess Basset is also from the Lyran constellation. Here's a depiction of the Lyrans. This is an extraterrestrial feline race, okay, from the constellation of Lyra. All right, now they are pretty much agreeable, meaning that they're benevolent beings. We got along with these beings. Uh, Bastet was actually uh, married to Inki, or uh, they also referred to him as Ptah. We all know Mumra was their main villain, okay? And uh, if you look at the emblem on his chest, it's a two-headed serpent facing each other, basically. It's a personification of reptilian chaos energy. These were their primary villains, okay? They were reptilians. We all know the Draconians are basically tyrants, all right? They're a very tyrannical race. Their objective is basically to create war and chaos. For those that aren't aware of who the Lyrans are, some say that these beings actually created the Elohim. It was referred to as the Lyran Syrian High Council, 
all right? And their uh, job was they overseeing the Syrians that uh, seeded the 12 strand DNAs on the 5D planet Terra. Again, a Lyran Syrian high council was basically in charge of hosting the seeding of 12 strand genetics on the planet. All of one was basically the personification of what's called the Christic ideology. So in perspective, this was a war of consciousness. This is a war between the Christ and the Antichrist. Christ meaning love and service to others, and Antichrist basically just meaning service to self. The Antichrist basically in perspective means a tyrannical mindset just in service to self and opposed to the collective conscious joining for love for others. Because these beings' objective is to basically oppress the law of one or go against the law of one, they basically are willing to mind control you to bend you to their will. They'll basically strip you of your free will. A lot of us think we are operating under our own accord, when most of the time it's MK Ultra, it's different things that are being induced in our neural physiology to basically make us basically their puppet master and everyone, all right, through different uh, technology and a, a lot of different chemicals and things of that nature, just to basically bend you to their will been depicted it in Thundercats. Mumra was a mummified mystic. He used mind control and a lot of different tactics to get the Thundercats to go against each other to basically get them off point and things of that nature. Mumra used a lot of mind control tactics and mind games. This is the same thing that's going on currently with the Draco Reptilians. They use MK Ultra. They use a lot of mind games to basically pull you away from who you truly are. This is why in Thundercats, they also showed us the importance of the third eye and seeing through the illusion. When uh, when Lionel picked up the Sword of Omens and he put it right here and he said, give me sight beyond sight, it opened that pineal gland up. And that's the representation of the pineal gland and seeing through the illusion. He was able to see. Hey, he's spitting, man. I don't know about them creating the Elohim, but he's spitting. See through all Mumra's magic all his illusions okay the fourth wall he put up to create that illusion that pineal gland will uh, will break it down this is why i stress the importance of getting your lion's mane mushroom or ginkgo biloba to decalcify your pineal gland and regenerate damaged brain cells i also highly recommend getting your blue lotus and mugwort leaf for access to transcendental states of consciousness these herbs are great for lucid dreaming as well as astral projection I do have all high quality herbs, elixirs, and metaphysical products for spiritual exploration available on Holistic Remedies for Ascension. For those who never seen this cartoon, or probably those who never seen it in years, you know what I'm saying? I'm an 80s baby, so I grew up on uh, cartoons like this. Go watch it again, it's a lot of gems in there. Peace, love, and light to everyone. What will you be doing on April 8th? I gotta rewatch. Thundercats! Thundercats! Oh, how oh, he said he put the sword up to his eye though, unlike the pineal gland. Man, that was kind of dope. You know, it's our thoughts below on that. Well, maybe they're doing something on Voltron too. We don't know about, man. Hey, I like this episode. April 8th is going to be a very powerful day um, in regards to spiritual energy. Lately, there has been consistent solar activity. We have three X-class solar flares back to back. Gamma ray radiation has been piercing our magnetosphere, causing complications in our electromagnetic grid. This is all part of the terraforming process that the planet is going through. Cosmic energy will have an effect on everything on the planet. Now, it's important that you pay attention to what you're doing at this time and where your energy is being focused on. On April 8th, some may decide to do a mass meditation. Some may decide to isolate themselves and completely go inward. Some may decide to clean up, rearrange things, change their whole environment. Some may decide to exercise. Some may decide to do their scholarship, completely gain knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and use that day as a day of research. Uh, some people, people like me, I'm going to go heavy into a psychedelic trip. That's what I'm going to do. Why those portals and gateways is open, I'm going to get my hands on some type of entheogen, and I'm going to completely dissolve the ego. That's what I plan on doing. I'm going to completely isolate myself, sit in darkness, and I'm going to tap into the mycelium network via entheogens. So what I plan on doing that day is I'm going to clean my area very good, all right? I'm going to get frank frankincense, some sage, sage everything down real good. I'm going to set my crystals out the night before, crystals like amethyst. I'm going to set them out and let them charge and stuff like that in the moon. Florida water is good. Also, cleanse your crystals with, spray them a little bit with the Florida water. I do that. 
I'm gonna I'm I'm clean everything real, real good. I'm gonna say my affirmations. I'm gonna put my affirmations in the universe. And then at that point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I typically get my blue lotus tea. I'll drink a little blue lotus tea with some lemon and honey. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll then dabble in my entheogens, get some shrooms or whatever the case may have you. Ayahuasca, something of that nature. And I'm gonna tap in. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go heavy. And when I go in, my, my objective isn't going to be for recreation. I don't do psychedelics for the purpose of recreation. I'm going to completely dissolve and eliminate the ego. That's going to be my complete objective. Um, I'm not going to do anything out of fear. I'm going to go with a heavy, heroic dose. Heavy, heroic dose. And uh, at that particular point in time, once uh, once everything's done, I'm going to report back to everyone and let them know exactly what transpired, what I've seen, why those celestial gateways is open. Uh, and, you know, typically when I do the Blue Lotus beforehand and uh, and then the entheogens kick in and allow me to astral project and navigate the trip a little bit more. You know, I've been to a lot of different planets and all kinds of things. I mean, I, I haven't even revealed most of my trip reports because a lot of people are not ready for a lot of that stuff. You know what I mean? I don't know if I could post this. My oh, man is. Uh, uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> he said a heroic dose. <laughs> he said a heroic. I can't do this. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> <sighs> Y'all remember the D.A.R.E. program? Man. <sighs> Heroic. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Man, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, he was on it though. I like him, man. He was on it about the uh, Thundercats, though. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm not mad at him, man. I'm not mad. But yeah, the Thundercats, man. <laughs> the beings that control and manipulate this realm are extraterrestrial reptilians from the Draco constellation. These are the ones affiliated with the government and the entertainment industry. The beings that control and manipulate this realm are extraterrestrial reptilians from the Draco constellation. These are the ones affiliated with the government and the entertainment industry. These beings have a tyrannical mindset opposed to the law of one. Uh, they're against Christ consciousness and unity. Now they do eat flesh. They do eat flesh. They do believe they're more superior to humans. Some of them actually have wings. The ones in the higher hierarchy actually do have wings and can fly. They typically are from 7 to 13 foot tall. These beings are the ones responsible for us being in an amnesia state. They thrive off low frequency energy like fear, sadness, grief, and guilt. The 13 families of the Illuminati consist of this extraterrestrial bloodline. A lot of these beings exist in subterranean bases. Most of them derive underground. They use high-tech equipment to bend light photon particles to hide their reptilian shape. But most don't realize that these beings don't only have the ability to actually shift from reptilian to humanoid. They also can appear completely invisible. These beings can literally be in the room with you and you wouldn't know it. To put it in perspective, think about the technology that the predator used when he's hunting. Typically, when people imagine these reptilians, they imagine them being green. But there's also a lot of dark, melanated looking ones, black uh, draconians, if you may. OK, that uh, actually do have Nubian looking features, the thicker lips. Uh, some of them even have a uh, hair. Some of them are part mammalian with the widow's peak as well. 
When they say shadow government, these are the beings they're speaking of. These are the beings that basically control things from the darkness. This is why there's a war between a light and a dark. The light will expose those camouflage and hidden in the dark. This is what the Great Awakening is about. It's about fully becoming aware of everything that's going on. Federation Council is an extraterrestrial network that facilitates chaos and order. If any of these male nullivant extraterrestrials were to go overboard, the Federation Council would be the uh, entities that would intervene. This is an amalgamation of various extraterrestrials from different star systems. Some of the most wise and spiritual are a part of this council. Most of us derive from different star systems as well. Planet Tiamat is a mixture of various extraterrestrial races as well. We're just camouflaged in these uh, humanoid avatars. Some of us are actually part of the Federation Council. When we uh, astral project and we astral travel and we venture off to the fourth dimension and we're fighting these malnelevant extraterrestrial beings, we're getting tutelage and we're receiving guidance from some of the hierarchy in the Federation Council. If you ever get the privilege of astral projecting and see, looking in the mirror, you would see you don't look nothing the same, okay? It's several times I looked in the mirror during an astral projection experience and looked it completely different. I was, I was mind blown. This is why you shouldn't have attachment to your three-dimensional avatar. Yes, you can love it and obviously appreciate it, but it's just a vehicle that you're using to tra traverse planet Tiamat for the time being. There's also interterrestrial beings that work us in synergy with us as well to uh, implement chaos and order as well on the planet. Some of us flown and even built ships and stargates. We just don't remember. This three-dimensional construct is definitely not who you are. It's just an illusion, part of the simulation that you're in. Militaries on this planet still haven't fully learned our cosmic star family's technology. In 2003, they found an element that we utilize to actually power our ships called Omnicron. They refer to it as uh, element 115. Uh, this element is so strong, it's stronger than 20, 20 inertia canceling so they can make sharp turns and fly super fast. They also could bend space and open wormholes. What if I told you that your co cosmic stargate replicate those ships, that these ships are actually modeled after our Merkaba and the piezoelectric crystals that fire off in our pineal gland when we uh, when we activate the Merkaba, the Merkaba, and we actually have the ability of flying off. They modeled their ships after that uh, spiritual technology. Most of their ships are made of piezoelectric quasi-crystals we return back to that it's time we actually tap back in to our primordial cosmic knowledge and really start building ships stargates and start really tapping back into who we are this is why they block us uh, and implement so many blockages in our pineal gland so we don't have the ability of access, access. he spent let me give him a sec uh stargates though he said something about stargates i do believe we had possibly had stargates back in the day we're gonna have to dive into that in that cosmic gateway because they know it's a wrap if we do stargates are opening back up as well tataria lemuria and atlantis will return we were a lot more muscular and physically fit than we are currently they poison our air they poison our water they put atrazine as well as xenoestrogens in everything that we consume what is a xenoestrogen uh, xenoestrogens are estrogen mimicking compounds which are not produced by our body okay so they are artificially implementing estrogen in certain things that we consume purposely to attack the testosterone in our body this is why erectile dysfunction is so prevalent in society today okay uh, this study found that around 52 percent of men experience some form of ed or erectile dysfunction and that total ed increases from about 5 to 15 percent between ages 40 and 70. so let's touch back on xenoestrogens for a bit okay xenoestrogens are pretty much in everything all right the cologne some of the fragrances we spray on our skin uh, water bottles when you get a plastic spring water bottle and, and consume it that plastic lining in the inside has xenoestrogens all through it it's pretty much impossible to dodge xenoestrogens and atrazine all you can do is combat it one of the best ways to combat it is actually training getting your ass in the gym exercising not being lethargic avoiding being lazy and making sure you actually are putting in the necessary time to train and exercise and women too much estrogen isn't good for you also okay remember you are composed of testosterone and estrogen yes you have more estrogen than testosterone which makes you a woman but you're not supposed to have that much estrogen this is also why sometimes you're having mood swings you're lethargic you're having issues of depression and things of that nature because you're over flooded with estrogen all right which makes you more sensitive you can permanently alter the DNA of a woman who mothers his children. This is wild. You need to choose your partners carefully.
It's called fetal microchimerism and it's this principle that when the embryo is developing inside the mother, there can be exchange in both directions of stem cells and those stem cells from the baby can stay with the mother for pretty much her whole life. What's even crazier is if you have an older sibling because their cells were inside your mother, those cells from your older sibling have actually transferred now into you, adding a whole new layer to a family bond. Almost as a thank you from the baby, when those stem cells go to the mother, they get dissipated throughout the body and they can even protect her against some cancers. No good thing in life comes without a catch though, and it's thought that these stem cells from the baby actually increase the risk of the mother developing autoimmune conditions. But what this also means is even if our mothers or our children aren't around anymore, we're still carrying a real alive part of them with us. Do you get your partner's traits from pregnancy? This is where an unexpected twist to our DNA story begins. Our nearest primate relative, as we mentioned previously, the chimpanzees, they have more chromosomes than we do with a total of 48 in their overall genome. Ironically, humans have only 46. In other words, it looks like we're missing two chromosomes when we're compared to chimps. Mystery of where those chromosomes went appears to have been solved. But in doing so, however, once again, we find ourselves at the threshold of an even deeper mystery that holds even more startling implications. A closer look at our genetic map shows that what has been thought to be our missing DNA in the past isn't really missing at all. It's been with us all along, only it's been modified and rearranged in a way that wasn't obvious in the past. The second largest chromosome in the human body, forming 8% of the total DNA in our cells, human chromosome number two, actually contains the smaller missing chromosomes found in the chimp genome. In other words, at some point in the past, for reasons that remain controversial, two separate chimp chromosomes were combined into a single larger chromosome that now is our chromosome number two. While scientists acknowledge that the mutations definitely occurred in FOXP2 and that they happened within the time frame that correlates with the rise of the anatomically modern humans, they can't really tell us what caused that change to happen. New technology has revealed precisely what happened to create human chromosome number two. So I'll share the discovery in two ways with you. First, in the scientist's own technical language from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences to reveal the details of the discovery itself. And then I'll describe it again with a simpler description in lay language to illustrate why this discovery is so important and what it means in our discussion. And this is a quote from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. We conclude that the locus cloned in Cosmids C8.1 and C29b is the relic of an ancient telomere to telomere fusion and marks the point at which two ancestral ape chromosomes fused to give rise to chromosome number two. I know that's a technical description and I wanted you to hear it in the researcher's own words. The simplified explanation. It appears that long ago, two separate chromosomes from chimpanzees, and these were chromosomes 2A and 2B, were merged or fused into the single larger chromosome that is now our human chromosome two. It's the key that gives us our humanness. Many of the characteristics that make us uniquely human come from this fusion. I want to be absolutely clear that what I say next is not the conclusion of peer-reviewed science, although I've spoken with mainstream scientists who have told me that they suspect what I'll share is true, yet they are reluctant to speak publicly about their suspicions in fear of losing their reputation their credibility or even their jobs. When I honestly consider the evidence that I've shared, it simply makes sense to look beyond evolution and an unbelievably good run of biological luck to explain the fact that we exist as we do. The evidence overwhelmingly suggests that, number one, we are the result of an intentional act of some kind. Point, the mutations in FOXP2 and human chromosome 2 are precise. Point, 
the mutations in FOXP2 and human chromosome 2 appear to have happened quickly. Point? The optimization of human chromosome 2 that occurred after the fusion happened appears to be intentional. Point? The fact that after 150 years of searching, no physical evidence has been discovered that links us to other forms of life on the tree of primate evolution suggests that we may be a species unto ourselves with no evolutionary history. Number two, we are the product of an intelligent form of life. Point, the timing, the precision, the accuracy of our genetic mutations, and the technology required to yield such mutations implies forethought and intention of an advanced intelligence. Point, the intelligence that carried out the genetic modifications, giving us our humanness, had the advanced technology to do so 200,000 years ago in a way that we are only learning to do today. For example, DNA fusion and gene splicing. To honestly acknowledge these possibilities opens us to a paradigm that shifts the way we feel about ourselves and the way we view our place in the universe. And with this shift, we free ourselves from a lonely paradigm of insignificance to one of a rare and unique heritage that we're only beginning to explore. We're here with the bodies and the nervous systems that afford us the extraordinary abilities of compassion, empathy, sympathy, intuition, self-healing, and much more. The fact of their presence within us suggests that we're intended to utilize and master these sensitivities that we've arrived with. From the time of our origin, we have been wired for these extraordinary abilities. This design affords us extraordinary ways of living and extraordinary lives. The question that immediately comes to mind when we consider that we've had such advanced characteristics from the time of our beginning is simply this. How do we fully awaken these capabilities in our lives today? What do they mean to us? I invite you to share a journey of discovery in which we will do our very best to answer not only this question, but to explore the deepest truths of our new human story. hair is from my dad's side and until my mom became pregnant with me she had pin straight hair all of a sudden it turned really curly i just found out a man's genes can actually alter yours if you're pregnant with their child to me that translates to they can turn you ugly too that's an so yes, family, this is so crazy and true. Your spouse can genetically modify your DNA. But with that being said, we'll have a doctor talking about it next. So let's get into it. Found out a man's genes can actually alter yours if you're pregnant with their child. No, because this process is actually crazy. It's called microchimerism. Um, hi, my name is Daphne. I'm getting my master's in public health. And I just find the human body is just so fascinating. Um, so basically, when uh, someone with female anatomy gets pregnant by their counterpart, um, there is a mother and fetal cell transfer that happens. Well, the fetus is made from two people. Therefore, she absorbs DNA from the other parent, which means that slowly over time yeah your hair patterns can change or you can become autoimmune to certain things or it can also strengthen certain genetic factors all of it is crazy and yeah it can affect anybody you can have a full pregnancy and have this happen or you can abort and have this happen and anything in between the two what? so it can literally happen to anybody so Yes, be careful with who you sleep with because they may alter your appearance. Yes, ladies, this is real huge and crazy, so be very mindful who you sleep with. But I might either make a playlist or a series about this because this is huge. Why, ladies? Because, yes, your boyfriend, your husband, yes, once you are impregnated by him, even if you have an abortion, 
Once that seed is developed in you, the DNA binds and literally it shows on the exterior. Absolutely. But you want to know what else is crazy? Y'all make sure y'all check out part two because in part two, I'm going to talk about what happens on the interior. So yes, not only does, you see what I'm saying? If you abort this baby or have his fetus or hold this child in any way, shape or form that that DNA binds on you, you see what I'm saying? And it shows on the exterior features. Y'all should really know what happens on the interior features to where a woman binds to a man. You see what I'm saying? And part two, we're definitely going to talk about that because it shows up. So that's the exterior. Then we're going to also talk about in part three, we're going to talk about ways to show up in her neural pathways. So yes, ladies, you literally start to think like this, man. We're going to discuss, we're going to talk about it. And then in part four, oh, that's really juicy. What I, what I got on, what I, what I got for y'all? I got some treats for y'all. Um, oh yeah, how to cleanse. This is huge. A lot of women don't even know how to cleanse past partners straight up. That's huge. That's all a part four. You see what I'm saying? And then part five, we're going to discuss how to actually cleanse because i want y'all to see what it looks like in part four so you know you know what i mean where you stand on the scale and then part five we're just going to talk about how to release past partners this is huge this is groundbreaking news with that being said it's the general and i'm out stay tuned man this episode is cooking man y'all need to be careful man you ask me find you one virtuous woman one that's all you need is one and to be honest you can't find it you gotta pray for it you know you gotta get down on your knees and be like man please lord send me one you know it's i just need one that i would cherish forever and ever please that's the only way you're gonna get one you know so do that get you one lock in for life and that's what it is you know something beautiful Y'all DNA is fusing. What y'all think about that? DNA fusing with your past? You know? How do you cleanse it is the question. The people that genetically modify. Epigenetics refers to DNA. In the depth. My curly hair is from my dad past where myth and reality intertwine we encounter a myriad of gods and deities that profoundly influence the spiritual of our ancient past where myth and reality intertwine we encounter a myriad of gods and deities that profoundly influence the spiritual life of the ancients among the oldest of these civilizations is Sumer often regarded as the cradle of human civilization their spiritual realm was a complex network of deities each holding specific roles and functions, ultimately governing the cosmos's course. One figure stands out amongst this celestial hierarchy, Enki, also known as Ea in Akkadian and Babylonian mythology. Enki, the Sumerian god of water, knowledge, mischief, and creation, occupied a prominent position. As the lord of the earth and the waters, he was revered for his wisdom, ingenuity, and creativity. Enki is widely credited for establishing Eridu, one of the earliest cities in Sumer, and initiating human civilization. Our knowledge of Enki and his counterparts primarily comes from ancient texts and inscriptions, including the Enuma Elis and the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Enuma Elis, the Babylonian epic of creation, describes the creation of the world and the celestial hierarchy, including the birth and deeds of Enki. The Epic of Gilgamesh, a quintessential piece of ancient literature, also provides glimpses into the divine realm and Enki's role in it. Together, these sources paint a vivid picture of the Sumerian cosmos, providing a foundation to delve deeper into Enki's role, especially concerning humanity's origins and development. In the heart of Sumerian mythology, we find a unique group of deities, the Anunnaki, whose name can be loosely translated as those of royal blood or offspring of Anu, sky. The Anunnaki hold a critical place in the Sumerian pantheon, often associated with the realms of the heavens, earth, and the underworld. Their roles were varied, ranging from celestial administrators, judges of humanity, to controllers of human destiny. The Anunnaki were not a homogeneous entity, but rather a complex hierarchy of divine beings, Anu, the sky god, was usually acknowledged as the leader of the Anunnaki. However, the actual control over Earth's affairs 
often fell to his offspring, namely Enlil, the lord of the air, and Enki, the god of water and wisdom. Enki's domain was mainly the watery abyss known as the Abzu or Apsu, a place that was thought to be the source of all fresh water, including rivers, wells, and the rain. But his influence extended beyond mere geography. As the bearer of wisdom and patron of arts and crafts, Enki played a significant role in developing and preserving civilization. The celestial hierarchy was also marked by numerous relationships, alliances, and rivalries. Enki's relationship with his siblings, particularly Enlil and Inanna, are noteworthy. These relationships influenced many mythological narratives and shaped the collective wisdom, laws, and societal norms in ancient Sumer. However, it was Enki's specific association with humanity and his alleged role in our creation and development that set him apart and endowed him with a unique place in ancient mythology. Enki is often represented holding a scepter with a ram's head, symbolizing his authority and connection with fertility. The ram, in Sumerian culture, was a symbol of virility and creative life force. This links back to Enki's role as a creator god and sustainer of life on Earth. Enki is also frequently shown seated and surrounded by flowing water. Water, being the source of all life, emphasizes his role as the life giver. As the god of fresh water, he was believed to have control over the rivers and seas, often depicted controlling the flow of water from his shoulders or vase, which underlined his authority over the life-giving and destructive aspects of water. Another potent symbol related to Enki is the Emes, pronounced May. In Sumerian culture, Emes were divine decrees or sacred powers that embodied the fundamental concepts and elements of civilization, ranging from truth and justice to music and art. As the god of wisdom and knowledge, Enki was often shown in possession of these Mes, symbolizing his role in bestowing civilization and culture upon humanity. Finally, the symbol of the caduceus, two serpents intertwined around a central staff, is also often associated with Enki. Some scholars argue that this symbol, representing Enki's role in genetic engineering and the creation of humanity, prefigures the modern symbol for DNA. Unpacking these symbols not only reinforces the narrative of Enki as a creator deity and god of wisdom, but also prepares us to delve deeper into the intriguing claims of his role in genetically modifying early humans. Now let us delve deeper into Sumerian literature to uncover the narratives that cast Enki as a master shaper or creator deity. These texts, inscribed on cuneiform tablets thousands of years ago, bear testimonies to the cultural and spiritual ethos of the Sumerian civilization and Enki's place within that cosmos. Prominent amongst the many narratives about Enki is the story of Enki and Ninma, where his role as a shaper of life is emphasized. Ninma, also known as Ninhursag, was another potent deity associated with the earth and fertility. This is known and this is mainstream, which is probably within the next 15 years, you'll have people flying around modding all sorts of RNA genes for their hair, for their skin, cosmetic, vanity. But you'll also have the bodybuilders taking it up a notch. So you'll have the genetic elite trying to get more modifications, realizing that their gifts were these genetic modifications, primarily low myostatin and AR density and these sort of things. And then you'll have the lesser genetically prone people with money being able to get the same RNA edits as the gifted guys. This is gonna even the playing field over time and this is gonna be that new element of biohacking and it's gonna push the bar even crazier. Yesterday I posted a video about Chile passing a law to protect genetically modified humans. Um, and a lot of people were in the comments talking about a Supreme Court case that had to do with um, something similar. So let's get into it because you know I have the receipts. This is the first page from the Supreme Court document. It's from 2013. I'm going to move out of the way so you can pause it and then we're going to get to page two because the first page isn't really that relevant. Pause to read if you'd like. So the court case is called Association for Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics, Inc. 
So at the top it says a naturally occurring DNA segment is a product of nature and not patent eligible merely because it has been isolated. But cDNA is patent eligible because it is not naturally occurring. Okay, so what is cDNA? cDNA or complementary DNA is produced by reverse transcription from mRNA template. mRNA, we've heard that so many times, haven't we? Remember how the document said that you can't patent DNA because it's naturally occurring? Well, let's read what is in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Hmm, it's synthetic mRNA. Now, what is the definition, synth definition of synthetic? Let's look. I can't talk. And one of the definitions of synthetic is prepared or made artificially. Okay, so synthetic is not natural, therefore it's patentable. Okay? It's wild out here, y'all. Military researchers in China successfully inserted a gene from tardigrades, commonly known as water bears, into human embryonic stem cells. This genetic modification has significantly enhanced the cell's ability to withstand radiation, potentially paving the way for the creation of super-resistant soldiers capable of surviving nuclear attacks. Tardigrades are extremely durable organisms, measuring less than one millimeter in size. They possess remarkable survival abilities, enduring extreme temperatures as low as minus 200 degrees Celsius, surviving in boiling water for over an hour, and even enduring the harsh conditions of space travel. These extraordinary traits are attributed in part to a specific gene that enables them to produce protective proteins, shielding their cells from the harmful effects of radiation and other environmental factors. Using the gene editing tool CRISPR-Cas9, the researchers successfully integrated the tardigrade gene into human DNA. In laboratory experiments, nearly 90% of human embryonic cells carry the water bear gene could withstand lethal doses of X-ray radiation. Given the significant genetic disparity between tardigrades and humans, the researchers initially expected potential harm or cell death from introducing the foreign gene. They acknowledged the risk of harmful mutations due to the genetic gap between the two species. They emphasized the uncertainty surrounding the immune response triggered by the unique protective proteins found in water bears. These considerations raised safety concerns, as previous studies have indicated potential failures in gene transfer between vastly different animal species. However, the experiment yielded surprising results as human cells were compatible with the tardigrade gene. Genetic analysis revealed no mutations in the altered cell's chromosomes, and the cells functioned normally. They even exhibited accelerated growth at specific developmental stages. The researchers affirmed that the experiment maintained cell viability and facilitated cell proliferation to some extent. Encouraged by these findings, the team plans to advance to the next phase of their research based on this promising outcome. One of the team's future goals is to transform embryonic stem cells modified with the tardigrade gene into blood-producing cells. This advancement holds the potential for addressing acute radiation sickness, or ARS, a significant medical concern faced by military personnel, civilians, and emergency workers during nuclear accidents and acts of terrorism. Implanting these modified cells into the bone marrow could increase the chance of survival in apocalyptic scenarios by generating radiation-resistant blood cells. Hey, that was a great example in that movie Prometheus. I never caught that. You guys seen that movie? <laughs>
evidence of a genetically modified human civilization. DNA cut back. We are under the Canaanites. The Canaanites are cannibalists. That's why they genetically modified buffalo to freaking cows. That's why cows have human instincts. That's why cows are so tamed. They share 80% of our DNA. You're eating another human. You are a cannibal. It don't matter what our digestive systems are. We are meant to eat the conscious fruit that falls off the tree and rots. It's not rocket surgery. You really think that you're here and there's a circle of life, you doofus, that you have to kill something and consume it. Well, the Eskimos did this, the people did this, the cavemen, cavemen did not exist. There's electric vehicles back in the early 1900s, 1901, 1902. You have no idea how many times they've reset this. They have created a complete fallacy of what our reality is and how things are. And they are laughing their asses off. Whenever you're celebrating a holiday, you're celebrating a sin. Thanksgiving is gluttony. Christmas is greed. You can flip it and be like, well, Christmas to me is about giving. Every day of your life should be about giving. DNA modifications that do not change the DNA sequence can affect gene activity. Chemical compounds that are added to single genes can regulate their activity. These modifications are known as epigenetic changes. The epigenome comprises of all the chemical compounds that have been added to the entirety of one's genome. As these two accounts and these two ancient tablets, they talk about the fact that Beings came from another planet to Earth because their planet was running low on resources. They were having some serious problems there. They came here to research, research and, re and use resources from this Earth and bring them back to their home planet, but also to create a breakaway civilization in this solar system, which they did. They created another level of another Atlantis on this uh, planet as a breakaway civilization and they will communicate back and forth to their home planet and even other star systems that existed where they all hailed from, whether it was Orion, whether it was Adelbron, whatever, they had communication devices that they would use. They, they had these tablets of destiny that we used to communicate back and forth through space. And, all, and they also have some type of level of technology, which I talked about in the Black Knight Satellite documentary that I did, which you can watch on Forbidden Knowledge TV. Now, they worked themselves they had a working class of i would say volunteers that were doing the work from their home planet they call them the egg these were the lower gods they called them they were people that were the grunt workers the middle class people as we, we would call them probably on earth they did a lot of the, the mining uh digging channels digging canals building uh buildings and structures and whatever they needed they did it they did this for about 200,000 years on their own. In other words, they never used human beings. They were using their own back labor, their own sweat and tears. They had machines called that which crunches and that which crushes. They would use those machines to dig holes and all kind of stuff and, and everything else. And these beings got pissed. They were mining on Earth and on Mars. And they got really angry because they were saying they needed to get a break and they were being forced to continue to work without breaks, without rest, without, um, they didn't have women they were complaining about. They had no women and they were getting pissed off. They decided to go to war against Enki and Lil and Anu, the Kings of earth. And, uh, and Anu was the father of Enki and Enlil. So they, they came from Mars. A group of them came from Mars to earth. These are the gods that fell from heaven to earth. That's what it means to go to war against, to rebel against God. In the Bible is what it says to rebel against God. They were re re rebelling against the head God, the head chief God, Anu. And uh, the only way that this war was stopped was the fact that they said, okay, Enki says, I have an idea that could stop this. There is an, a, there's an existing hominid on this planet, existing being on this planet. We can add our essence to it and get it to hold and bear the load of the labor. And he was saying adding essence. He's talking about doing a genetic modification, adding their DNA, maybe unplugging some of our own DNA, making us into like, uh, hominid robots for them to do the late labor and the work. And so this was agreed upon to stop the potential coup in the war. And these beings then started gen genetically manipulating our cousins that were already here on this planet Earth. They already, we were already here. We were seated on this planet by some Pleiadians. If you don't believe me, talk to the, uh, talk to the aboriginals. The aboriginals verbal handed down history for thousands of years is that they were seated on this planet by people from the Pleiades.
to protect the race and save the race from the a galactic war that was going on. So Earth, before the Anunnaki got here, the ones that became Atlanteans, before they got here, we were already here. Earth is an abandoned seed colony. We were an abandoned seed colony before they got here. They didn't even mess with us for quite some time. But about 200,000 years ago, they decided to tinker with us, genetically modify us, turn us into biological robots to do their labor. And how did they get us to fall for this? After genetically modifying us, disconnecting some of our DNA, that's why we have junk DNA, they went ahead and uh, let me just put my... They went ahead uh, and and began to uh, modify, modify our DNA. And then once they created what they want, a version of us, we, they, we weren't created from dust. Once they created a version of us that they actually wanted that can do the workload and everything else and be obedient, how did they do this? They inserted something called a worship gene into the human genome. Let me tell you that again. They inserted a worship gene into the human genome. Yes, you heard me correct. We've already found it. Biolo biologists and scientists have already discovered People who've researched the gene, a human genome, they've already discovered the gene, and it can be turned on and it can be turned off. So when they turn the gene off, the person doesn't have the need or want to worship anything on the outside anymore. When they turn the gene on, the person goes back to wanting the, a feeling of wanting to worship something on the outside. So they inserted a worship gene into us, and that way they could actually trick us into doing the workload by not thinking we were being enslaved, but by making us think that they were gods. Each one of these beings ruled over particular regions, and those... I don't know, man. That might be a little bit of a stretch. A, a, a little bit. It's, it's an interesting story, but it's... I can't go. Those people didn't have any... And I'm not saying that they, I believe he said that they haven't, they didn't create humans. They just took some of them and already did this, but I don't know. We, I would have to decipher the tablets in Kunani form and see exactly what was said. In the Pleiadian story, where is there any hieroglyphs, any type of manuscript on any type of Pleiadian? I would love to see it anything any way of traveling didn't have any way of getting around the planet so for the most part the person that was ruling over them that was god to them whichever one that was right whether it was marduk whether it was uh, enki whether it was enlil whoever it was thoth they believed these people were gods now what's interesting about thoth the atlantean priest king is what he calls himself this guy right here Right, he's always depicted with the head of an ivory bird, even though he had a human face. He was the only one, uh, him and him, him and Enki were the only two, actually, that said, no, we're sons of Atlantis. And, uh, you know, so they told the humans that they were not gods, but everyone else, oh, they ate it up. Listen, they were like, yes, I'm your God, bow to me, pray to me, bring me burnt offerings. And so they literally had humans out here grinding and working back-breaking labor, doing the, taking on the, bearing the workload that they themselves used to have to do. And the humans doing it willingly because they thought it was an honor to their gods. So they were enslaved, but didn't know they were even slaves, which is the best slave you can create. Look at what they have today in our modern society. We have a modern slave trade going on every single day, especially in places like America, right? How? Well, you have this fake currency system, this fiat currency, money that doesn't even exist. It's just pieces of paper with conscious attributed value to it. And these people have you thinking that without that fake source of uh, what we call currency, that's not, really nothing but paper, without this paper, you can't have a good life. <laughs> you can't do anything. You can't go anywhere. You can't have a nice car. You can't have a nice, a nice house, right? You can't afford to buy food for yourself until you have this 
imaginary green paper in your hands. And when you have that imaginary green paper, somehow magically you can do all these things. And so to get this green paper, you got to work and you got to work hard and you got to work hard nonstop and you got to grind 24 seven. We're all enslaved. We're all, we've all been enslaved in a system where now what is the God is the monetary system and the monetary system has us basically doing the work and we're doing the work and doing the work and doing the work. And we think it's because we have to have that. So we have to have that, those papers, those green papers, or we can't do anything. That's the kind of system they put us into. So we've, we've been enslaved through a fiat fake currency system. That's just one way we've been enslaved. We've also been enslaved through religion. That's another control system that they put on top of us. And then we've also been enslaved by the political system, another enslavement. There is no such thing as a d Democrat or Republican. There's no such thing as a Democrat or Republican. Those people are masquerading as your God, period, point blank. The only thing that does exist is a group of psychopathic oligarchs that destroy the world and kill and torture women and children and men worldwide. That's what does exist. You want to call them a politician, I call them destroyers, all of them. And so you have to understand this, guys. These, are, these people are copying the ancient tradition of masquerading as a god, literally. There's no doubt in people with higher melanin, natural higher melanin, that it's far more likely that that melanin will be coating the nucleus, yeah. the cell wall of the nucleus of the DNA. Now, the point about that is that um, ultraviolet light, which is often used to splice DNA, is blocked by that melanin. It absorbs it. It doesn't allow it in to, uh, to interfere with the DNA. And it could well be, and this is Nigel's thesis, that this was a blocker for them when they were trying to genetically alter the species. And therefore, when maybe just out of random mutation, something like an albino came along, they discovered, wow, we can get straight in. And it may well be that the paler skinned nation, people of, uh, on the earth, may be, have that pale skin because of this genetic experimentation to make things easier for them to work on human DNA. And in fact, Professor Steve Jones argues that this thing about vitamin D being, uh, paler skin being there to allow vitamin D to be absorbed and so on, all these theories about why pale skin happened in the first place, he believes it's not an adequate explanation. There is no real explanation or justification for the need for pale skin at all. Yeah, because I think if dark skin is always an advantage in every right. circumstance. I'm lost on these waters, man. I don't know what to believe now. Um, genetic modification. Language is being split. Using ultraviolet light now. Could that be? That is a huge pivotal pivotal point. They are using ultraviolet light to do something with the DNA. That is interesting. I was hired in December of 1988 to replace one of these men. These beings conveyed information about the capability of affecting the human brain to anesthetize the human body. This is done without any physical contact from a remote source. For this anesthesia to be accomplished, the brain has to be in a relaxed state similar to that required for hypnosis. If the brain is subject to any external stimulation like stimulant drugs or loud music, this manipulation of the nervous system is ineffective. These beings said that man was the product of externally corrected evolution. They said that man as a species had been genetically altered 65 times. They referred to humans as containers, yet I don't know what we're containers of. Or we could be a vessel for the Ruach or the Holy Spirit. Um, CRISPR. Where are we at? Um, CRISPR. Where are we at able being able to actually alter DNA? Like, every tell everyone here what CRISPR specifically is. But where are we at on our where right now? Where are we? And if you were to forecast, say within the next five years, where do you believe we are on able to actually alter? DNA that way. Yeah. Well, right now it's it's possible to add genes to humans. So we, we've cured, not we, but 
Mm. Scientists and doctors have cured genetic this diseases so that incredible. way. incredible. Blind people. Am I tripping? Does he look like he got the demon syndrome a little bit? People are seeing again. Yes. But it's only it's small. It's, it's thousands of people. It's not millions yet. Mm -hmm. This dude right there, here right? might have and the demon syndrome. Probably in, certainly in this decade, uh, we'll see. That we, we've cured, not we, but mm -hmm. scientists and doctors have cured genetic this diseases so that incredible. way. so incredible. Blind people are seeing again. Yes. But it's only small. It's, it's thousands of people. It's not millions yet. Mm -hmm. But we are getting better at it. And mm -hmm. eventually, probably in, certainly in this decade, uh, we'll see people being able to add genes to their bodies more commonly. But CRISPR is different. CRISPR is not adding genes. It's actually changing, changing. Yep. your genetic makeup permanently. Mm -hmm. uh, and so where we're at is there are, there are some genes or some studies that have shown that it works in humans. You can correct sickle cell yeah. anemia and fix that. Mm -hmm. That one's a little easier because it's in the bloodstream. Trying to fix Alzheimer's with CRISPR is going to be a lot more challenging. The blood is easy to access. And the way we do it is we put a CRISPR system, which is an enzyme that you can direct to change the DNA uh, with a barcode. Mm -hmm. um, so our DNA has different letters. There's six feet of this DNA molecule in every cell. And there are these four letters, A, C, T, G. And they're in different or, um, sequence. And what CRISPR does that's kind of incredible, if you think about it, is that you can give it a code that says, go find the sequence that's A, T, G, C, A, G, C. And it'll find it incredible. in billions of combinations in that six foot and go in and just change that. Incredible. They will actually take a piece of your DNA out. It will replace it with a synthetic one and, and a synthetic piece. So, you know, who knows what they're going to modify about you. But that also makes you patentable. The they can own you. We have two strands of DNA out of 12 activated right now. Now, what's happening is that the sun is activating us. But we can't receive that sun's energy if we aren't open to it. And we aren't open to it when we're in these lower levels because the dense, the denseness of those emotions is literally like a cloud. You know how the, the sun doesn't shine through the clouds near as much? It's not near as bright. Well, that's essentially what these lower levels of consciousness are. They don't allow you to receive these upgrades. And so another part of the test is being able to receive it. I'm here today to tell you that we're actually hacking the software of life and that it's changing the way we think about prevention and treatment of disease. So here's all the biology you need to know in 30 seconds. Our body is made out of organs. Our organs are made out of cells. And in every cell, there's this thing called messenger RNA, or mRNA for short, that transmits the critical information from the DNA, our genes, to the protein, which is really the stuff we're all made out of. This is the critical information that determines what a cell will actually do. And so we think of it like an operating system. And so if you could actually change that, which we call the software of life, if you could introduce a line of code or change a line of code, it turns out that has profound implications for everything so many of us get a vaccine. A man on TikTok has been experiencing a strange transformation in his body, a shape-shifting transformation according to him, after having spent some time in the Navy. And this is his first video on TikTok. Check this out. A real reptilian eye doesn't necessarily have a slit. It has a membrane that can slide back and forth, allowing people to see a little bit better in the dark. It also allows you to change the color of your eye just a little bit. If you notice the changes on my page, I've had these changes the last year and a half. Uh, share it if you want. Say it's cap if you want. I won't give a shit, but it's real. After having his account and his videos deleted, he opened a second account and uploaded this video. Check this out. Now. What you're about to hear is real. My name, it's not too important. The information that I'm about to tell you is extremely important. I was an intelligence specialist with the United States Navy. Since then, if you watch my other videos, you realize that strange things have started to happen to my body. If you remember, my eye has started to get more of a slit in a reptilian or I guess snake eye appearance. If you look at my other videos or what I'm adding right here, you can actually see up close what my eye looks like. If you remember my body in certain areas, like for example, you look at my elbows on both sides, 
I'm growing additional limbs, my hands, my thumbs. They're extending and growing too. At first, I just put out a cry for help on TikTok. I didn't know who's going to answer, who's going to respond. Other people out there that went through similar experiences. I'm one of, if you notice, the first people. I did a bad thing. Is one of tragedy and warning. Medusa was a beautiful priestess in Athena's temple, but she made the mistake of becoming romantically involved with Poseidon, the god of the sea, in Athena's temple. According to some versions of the Medusa myth, she was indeed by Poseidon. However, other versions of the myth do not mention explicitly and simply describe Medusa's relationship with Poseidon as a consensual affair. As punishment, Athena transformed Medusa's hair into snakes, making her hideous and feared by all who looked upon her. Medusa was cursed to turn anyone who looked at her into stone. Years later, Perseus, the son of Zeus, was tasked with slaying Medusa as a part of a quest. With the help of Hermes and Athena, he obtained a reflective shield and a sword, and was able to decapitate Medusa without being turned into stone. From Medusa's blood, two creatures were born, Pegasus, a winged horse, and Chryseor, a golden warrior. Perseus used Medusa's head as a weapon against his enemies, and eventually gave it to Athena, who placed it on her shield. Medusa's fate serves as a warning against hubris and the consequences of acting against the gods. The story of Medusa reminds us of the power of the gods. Medusa artifacts are being uncovered all over Spain. Let's get into it. The first artifact which you can find here is tile flooring that was in a wealthy person's home. It's of Medusa before she had snake hair, basically, and they considered her something that was used for protection because in their mind, they were protecting themselves from evil with something else that was evil. Which is actually really sad because I love Medusa and her story is super tragic. Another item that was found, which is much smaller but not any less significant, is a medallion, which you can see here. What do you think of all the Medusa stuff that's been popping up recently? So uh, Athena turned her hair to stone? You know, I'm just trying to see if there's any truth in this story. You know, I feel like there's a, a little truth in all stories. And I believe they could have used some technology to probably change your hair to snakes. How cool would that be? What type of Naki technology could be possible for that? But um, something else kind of reminds me of when she turns to uh, enemies to stone is Lot's wife. When she turned to salt, you know, so I'm just seeing a little bit of similarities there. But Lot's wife and Medusa. Truth about Medusa. In some myth, Medusa was a beautiful maiden, her greatest pride being her magnificent hair. She served as a priestess in the temple of Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war, and was bound to a life of celibacy. However, Medusa's beauty caught the eye of Poseidon. Driven by desire, Poseidon raped Medusa within the sacred confines of Athena's temple. This act of desecration deeply angered Athena. Yet instead of directing her fury towards Poseidon, Athena's wrath fell upon Medusa. Medusa's luscious hair turned into a writhing nest of venomous snakes, and her once striking face became so hideous that her mere gaze could turn a man to stone. This curse not only robbed Medusa of her beauty, but also isolated her from the world, as her monstrous appearance made it impossible for her to interact with others without harming them. Years later, the hero Perseus was tasked with obtaining Medusa's head. Perseus approached Medusa while she slept, using the shield as a mirror to avoid her deadly gaze. He beheaded her in her slumber. In the end, we are left to wonder, did Medusa really deserve her fate, or was she merely a victim of the gods wrath and injustice it's like why why create such an elaborate story medusa was the daughter of the primordial sea gods four seas and Sido. medusa was the youngest of three sisters and together they were called the gorgons medusa steno and uriel all three were greatly feared for their appearance was terrifying and nauseating and they had the bad reputation of being evil beings except for medusa Although Medusa was the only mortal of the sisters, she was a beautiful woman and her beauty was praised by mortals and gods throughout her life, for it was said that no one on earth possessed such beauty, whereas her sisters possessed a truly terrifying appearance. In time, Medusa became a faithful devotee of the goddess Athena, and along with her sisters and her best friend Iphicles, she would play pretend to be the goddess Athena. 
She deeply admired Athena, so much so that she actually wished to be like her. She spent her childhood surrounded by adventures with her best friend Iphicles. She grew up in a home full of happiness, and when she grew up, she had grown into a beautiful woman, with her admirable beauty shocking anyone who saw her. Medusa fervently wished to become a priestess and belong to the temple of the great goddess, and she said that when she was old enough to do so, she would give up everything to be part of the temple. On the other hand, Iphicles, Medusa's best friend, spent every day very close to the young girl, so he inevitably fell deeply in love with Medusa. Iphicles had kept his feelings to himself for many years, as they were still too young to enter into a relationship, and he believed that Medusa might not reciprocate. One day, both went for a walk as usual, and amid laughter the two stood face to face, staring at each other with loving eyes, and in that moment, Iphicles took the opportunity to confess his love to Medusa. The young man, very nervous, told Medusa that he loved her deeply and that he wished to be by her side for all eternity. The beautiful maiden with a big smile on her face told him, I love you too, and hugged him tightly. However, as soon as she took off from his arms, Medusa erased her smile, and touching his face she said seriously, But our love can never be, I can never be with you because there is something that I wish with all my being. The beautiful young woman took Iphicles to the temple of Athena and told him, I long to become a priestess of the great goddess Athena, and to belong I must be pure and not fall into temptations. Iphicles loved Medusa so much that he decided to support her in her great dream. He understood that the happiness of the beautiful woman was the most important thing to him. In time, Medusa reached the ideal age when she could begin to prepare herself to be a priestess of Athena, and so she went to the temple to give herself eternally to her, for the goddess. Little by little, the hard teachings of the new aspirants in the temple of Athena began. The young women had to have absolute purity to appear before the great goddess of wisdom because Athena herself was pure. The preparation to belong to the temple of Athena was too demanding, the apprentices had to go through hard tests where they had to demonstrate their discipline, wisdom, exemplary conduct, and purity. Medusa achieved her lifelong dream, and became a respected priestess. The beautiful woman was really committed to her job, so she was catalogued as a perfect priestess because her conduct and discipline were impressive. Over the years the beautiful priestess began to gain fame among the devotees who attended the temple of Athena. The great beauty of Medusa captivated all the men who watched her, while she performed the sacred rituals in the temple. With her beautiful face, slender figure, and extremely shiny and precious hair, Medusa had caught many by her charms. These admirers knew that the beautiful young woman would never reciprocate, and so they only admired and honored her from afar. Little by little, in the land, the news that a beautiful young woman was attending the temple of Athena spread rapidly, causing more and more people to attend the temple of the goddess, just to observe the beautiful priestess. The devotees who attended the temple of Athena were more and more insistent in denoting the beauty and perfection of Medusa because they were not only amazed with how beautiful she was, but also admired the perfect way in which she performed the various rituals and activities in the temple. On the other hand, from Mount Olympus, Athena was watching everything that happened in her temple, and observed with great stealth what was happening with respect to Medusa. One day, while Medusa was performing the daily rituals in the temple of the goddess, thousands of devotees arrived. Athena was pleased and flattered and she immediately fixed her gaze on her temple as she sat down to watch herself being glorified by thousands of people. However, from the crowd, a man shouted in a loud voice, Medusa! You are much more beautiful than Athena, even your hair is much more beautiful. Furious, Athena realized that the crowd was not at her temple to worship her, but had come to the sanctuary only to see one of her faithful priestesses, the lovely Medusa. Athena thought that conspiring against the devotees who came to her temple was not the right thing to do. Besides, she knew that Medusa was not to blame for what was happening, since she did not do it on purpose. So at that moment she did nothing against her supposed devotees, nor against Medusa, and she dedicated herself to observe with bitterness, since her worship was being overshadowed by the beautiful priestess. All the gods of Olympus witnessed what was happening in the temple of Athena, and full of curiosity for the beautiful young woman, they had planted their gaze on her. 
Poseidon observed the dissatisfaction of Athena and immediately believed that it was the right time to execute his revenge because for a long time both gods maintained multiple disputes for sovereignty. Poseidon and Athena had had a terrible confrontation in which they disputed the capital city of the Attica region. Both wanted to be the great rulers of the city, and they wanted their people to revere them. However, after a great confrontation, Athena won the battle, keeping the beautiful city of Cecropia, which was later baptized with the name of Athens, in honor of the goddess. Since that terrible quarrel in the past, Poseidon wished to take revenge on the goddess, and although many years had passed, he never forgot the hatred he felt towards Athena. Poseidon saw how the goddess had all the attention on his most faithful and exemplary priestess. So he immediately Usa began to devise a time that would Athena. tarnish the reputation Athena of Athena was too demanding with her priestesses since what they did and presented to their followers strongly influenced her reputation, so she did not want any mistakes of her priestesses to stain her honor. The god of the seas thought that the most exemplary of the priestesses would be the instrument of his revenge. He would make Athena's reputation be torn to shreds, thus taking revenge on the goddess, by destroying her through Medusa. Poseidon watched Medusa stealthily for several days, delicately analyzing all her movements so as to attack her at the right moment. He spent hours and hours building his plan, and even the god himself was enchanted by the beauty of the young woman. One day Medusa, as usual, went for a walk on the beach, when suddenly she heard a deep voice calling her name. Frightened, Medusa looked in all directions, and saw how an imposing and slender being emerged from the waters. It was the god Poseidon. At that moment Medusa was totally paralyzed, and while Poseidon tried to seduce her, the innocent young woman tried to reject his advances. Poseidon, with flattery and deception, tried to get hold of the young girl. However, Medusa did not forget her vows, so she flatly refused to have relations with her. Hey, that story was a long one. I thought they were going to talk about how maybe her hair got transformed and whatnot, but I guess not. Years ago in Mesoamerica and soon became one of the largest societies in the Americas. The Aztec had complex spiritual beliefs that played a role in every part of their culture and day-to-day -day life. The Aztecs, in their own words, they are not from Mesoamerica. In their own words, they came from somewhere in the north. The founders of the Aztec Empire arrived in a region already settled by major societies. To survive, they had to master the art of conquest. The Aztecs were a people having come into the Valley of Mexico and establishing themselves in the 13th century, very quickly found themselves uh, under uh, the auspices of a, a brutal warlord by the name of Tezosomoc. Eventually, the Aztecs formed a triple alliance with the cities of Tlacopan and Texcoco and Tenochtitlan, and that, that formation in, in the 1440s uh, basically allowed the Aztecs to go up against this kingdom at Azcapotzalco, and they literally annihilated it. Having done that, they then stood up against some 40 other major kingdoms, and they wiped them out as, as part of that juggernaut of development and expansion. Resolved to maintain its status as Mesoamerica's dominant force, the Aztec rulers demanded commitments of military support and resources from each city in its domain you would be assigned the equivalent of an emissary. And that emissary would be assigned to that site and there would be a companion emissary in the capital to receive the tribute. And as long as you paid tribute, you were allowed the autonomy necessary. What the Aztecs are actually promoting in their empire is what we can call an imperial pax or an imperial peace. Which means that while that tribute is moving, it's moving through safe roads. Whoever dares to steal the tribute is going to be punished. And what it allowed was for a mobilization of resources across vast areas while allowing indigenous autonomy in every community. So long as you paid tribute to the cabecera or the head, in this case Tenochtitlan and the Aztecs, you could maintain your system of deities, gods, your system of agriculture, your polity, your kings, etc. So now I can walk not only to the next town, but I can walk hundreds of kilometers inside the Aztec Empire with whatever thing I want to uh, sail 
and trade. The tribute that is being received by the Aztecs is also being returned to the Mesoamerican economy and is going to create growth. The capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, was a sprawling city of canals, pyramids, markets, residential neighborhoods, and artificial islands on what is now the present-day site of Mexico City. The Aztecs have the, the belief that uh, nothing comes out of nothing. In order to create life, something needs to die. And the most precious life they could give was the life of humans. The energy of the individuals is in the blood, in the fluid, the sacred liquid. Let's put it this way, they created a, a religious economy in which basically uh, lives have to be given to the divinities. So were the Aztecs violent? Yes, but it's organized violence, violence with a purpose. The Aztec rulers built a society that in many ways was unparalleled in the world. In the Pacific Northwest region of North America, Indigenous people developed a complex society that was governed by the ownership and passing down of songs, dances, titles, and names. These laws and privileges were embedded in a ceremony known as the potlatch. During the potlatch, people from neighboring villages were invited to witness a ceremony, and gifts were distributed as a sign of wealth and power by the host chief and his family. Gatherings of families and communities often took place during the winter months. During the winter time is when we held our most important ceremonies, when we would invite other villages to come to our communities, and we would host them and, and feed, feed them the whole time that they were there. So they might be there for two weeks or, or a month. Our people were very giving of, of everything that we had. And that's how you connected with your other villages. That's how alliances, loyalties, and uh, trust was created through those connections. And it didn't just happen amongst the Kwakwa Kiwak. We were very interactive. And that's a misconception too, that the Haidas, the Chimpsians, the Tlingkets, the Salish, the West Coast people were separate. No. One people, one family. Of course, we spoke different languages, but we shared the same customs. We shared the same blood. When I think of potlatching, I think of uh, marriage, which is a sacred union between two people, uh, between two houses. What's really important is uh, the dowry, what the female brings to her husband's family, validated through potlatching, marriage, leads to the birth of children, naming our children, honoring the children uh, when they come of age, lifting them up into uh, adulthood with dignity, with the teachings of their responsibilities. Those sort of things were, are entrenched into the potlatch system. And that's, again, that connected. That's good information. It's just shows what was really going on back in America. Tesla said that there's three things required to unlock the secrets of the universe. 
energy, frequency, and vibration. Nikola Tesla said that there's three things required to unlock the secrets of the universe. Energy, frequency, and vibration. And all around us, even when we can't see it, the world is vibrating. And there's many frequencies all around us, and there's many frequencies of light that we can't see, and there's many frequencies of sound that we cannot see. But we can visualize it, and even with water, we can play music or any other sounds, and we can see these cymatic patterns, these frequencies, as they're played through the water. And how does that relate to the history? Well, if this is possible, then is it not possible that we could use this technology for other things? And maybe there's some secret that we just don't know. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Jesky Chuck. And if you haven't already, hit that like and subscribe button, because today we're going in deep and we got another banger. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Aliens have been trying to leave us technology for free energy devices for a very long time. Now, if you guys question the authenticity of crop circles, I highly suggest doing some research. And if you're too lazy to do the research, I've done it for you, and so is this man. This is Professor William Levengood, and he's been studying crop circles for a very, very long time. Now, what we noticed on the real crop circles is the seeds of the stalks would all explode out of the nodes, and the crops would coil up like this, and the magnetic energy at these sites is off the charts. Now, with that being said, some are fakes, not all possess these qualities. But when you look into these real ones, it's easy to see that they're trying to give us free energy devices. This crop circle is placed in front of a windmill and it displays magnetic wheel energy, something far more sustainable than windmills. And it's also free energy. Here's another magnetic motor that was created off of a crop circle blueprint. And an Italian inventor named Umberto Berdao created this free energy device off this alien created crop circle blueprint. There is absolutely no doubt that the UFOs are creating these crop circles to help us unlock the secrets of the universe. This one represents our seven chakras, our seven energy centers within the body. Unlocking these energy centers will help any individual tap into the secrets of the universe. You'll see many crop circles represent magnetic fields. And all these crop circles are created using extreme mathematical precision and divine sacred geometry. There is no doubt that the UFOs are trying to help humanity reach our full potential. Peace and love. When was the last time you heard about a crop circle? It's like they didn't completely fell off. I haven't heard about a crop circle in about like four or five years. But the pieces are starting to get connected, of course. Imagine, if you will, that you are the supercomputer that powers reality. That without you, there is nothing. There is no universe, there is no objects, there is... I mean, literally everything that you perceive reality to be simply is not there unless you are there to observe it, correct? Imagine, if you will, that you are the supercomputer that powers reality, that without you, there is nothing. There is no universe, there is no objects, there is... I mean, literally everything that you perceive reality to be simply is not there unless you are there to observe it, correct? It's a, in a, in a sense, a feedback system. The world inside of yourself, the energy inside of you, is also the same as the energy outside of you, communicating with itself. It's a feedback system is everywhere present in unlimited quantities. I can drive the world's machinery without the need of coal, oil, gas, or any other fuel. This new power for the driving of the world's machinery will be derived from the energy which operates the universe, the cosmic energy. Dang, he is cruising. Play that again.
Wow. Radiation coming from the microwave, we compare it to an Apple Watch. So here's the microwave, we're going to keep it on. Right in front of it, near almost a million microwatts. 113,000 microwatts per square meter, and we're this far away from the microwave. Let's kill the microwave. We'll go right back down into the green like we should. Okay, come over here. This phone's on airplane. Airplane mode, so we know that that's not contributing. All right, let's kick this thing on. Look at there's a nice little 10,000 microwatt spike. And you got to realize when you guys are wearing these things, they're constantly connecting to the cell tower to try to see if there's any new text message. Are there any new updates? So that's the Bluetooth or the Wi-Fi. No, that's the Wi-Fi kicking on. You hear that? Listen to this thing. We'll turn the volume down. If only Apple had this at the sales booth right next to it, no one would buy it. All right, so let's like slice it open. So we've peaked at 21,000. You might not be able to see that, but it is in airplane mode. Right up here is the airplane mode icon. Now we're gonna put it in this little Faraday bag immediately into the green. It's magic. <coughs> Let me make sure all my devices are in airplay mode real quick. But all seriousness, that was crazy. It says pay close attention to the detail, to the face controlled on the robot's chest plate. How do they have this back in the day though? What is that, y'all? Is this ancient technology? How to carve stone using sound and vibration. Wow. That is interesting. So how did they do this back in the day is the question. That's a perfect cut stone. I wonder if you can make keys like that as well. Imagine like a stone key that could open a door to a hidden door in a mountain or something.
So is this how hieroglyphs were made? Or was it chiseled? I'm gonna go back to this clip I played yesterday, but it's very appropriate for today. If we look at how they were just able to cut those rocks, if we look at the precision and detail on these, I wonder. Again, how the light is getting absorbed into it. That's just so fascinating. I want to do this one day. Are the walls, did they use some type of vibrating technology to cut perfect details into the wall? I mean, if you look at these, those are straight lines. That is interesting your guys' thoughts in the comments below let me know if they're use some type of ancient technology for the hieroglyphs or did they really take the time and meticulously use hand tools but never but nevertheless let's dive into some more videos This experiment actually looks fun. I wonder if it would actually work. Made with magnets, huh? That setup does look interesting, and I wonder how much voltage it actually produces out. This engine is interesting. Look how, look how it's, it's rotating by itself. This is all from magnets. Huh? I wonder how much he can power with that. Wow. On this video, it's just music playing, so he's not explaining the process. Like, unfortunately, we cannot hear what he's saying. Huh. He gives you the blueprint for it, too? Wow. I 
wonder if this could power like a whole house. Interesting. Well, if you guys know anybody that has a dam or uh, some moving water near your house, boy, do I got an answer for you. bit loud but it worked whoever invented this is a true genius and no one could have seen this coming china has once again astounded the world with an unprecedented feat the construction of an underwater power station many countries are in awe and you won't believe what's next introducing the largest tidal energy power station in china the Zhongxia tidal power station this incredible marvel annually contributes over 10 million kilowatt hours of clean energy to the grid. With a total capacity of 3,000 kilowatts, it boasts six 500 kilowatt water turbine generators that operate for 14, 15 hours a day. Oh, uh, we gotta catch up. To produce completely pollution-free clean energy. It's a testament to China's audacious vision and pioneering spirit that they dared to dream and build a power station under the sea. It's truly mind-blowing. Behind these colossal engineering achievements, there shines an endless beacon of technological progress and innovation. China's relentless infrastructure development and technological prowess are redefining the boundaries of what's possible. Stay tuned for more groundbreaking innovations. Uh, yeah, we got to catch up, man. Aren't they on fiber optics out there, too? Oh, my goodness, man. That is a great idea. If we had one of those, if we had probably about four of those around our coastline. You know, it should be able to power all the homes in that area. I'm surprised we're not doing that. But, you know, I'm sure there's some underlining factors going here. But let's keep it going, y'all. I hope you guys like this. It's a little bit learning, you know, showing you the possibilities, you know, for education purposes, of course. But let's keep going. This device right here has sent me down the deepest rabbit hole. And that's because this is a source of free energy that has a very mysterious history and could be linked to UFOs. But for several years now, a small group of scientists here has been investigating a strange new space age metal a nickel-titanium alloy called nitinol. In cold water, nitinol turns soft. Bend it and it stays bent. But in hot water, it springs back with forces as high as 55 tons a square inch. No one knows quite why this happens. Several years ago, McDonnell Douglas began experimenting with nitinol in the form of springs. At room temperature, the nitinol wire springs bend easily. But in warm water, they spring back, thus forcing the wheel around. Even stranger, nitinol wires get stronger the more they're used. They develop a double memory. They not only contract in the warm water, but they begin to stretch of their own accord in the cool water. Nitinol can be trained. And then there's this document that was written from the Battelle Memorial Institute to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio in 1949. And of course, the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is known for allegedly storing the crashed UFO that happened in Roswell in 1947, which was just two years before this contract was written. And in this document, they're talking about the different alloys that they're testing, and they're giving a progress report on those tests. And at this time, Nightnall went by a different name. And a lot of the serious UFO researchers believe that the Battelle Memorial Institute was the organization that was given the contract to examine and test all the metals that were retrieved from the Roswell crash. And one more interesting thing about Battelle is that they are the same organization that invented coating and metals that were used on spy planes that were then later used on the U-2 and the SR-71. Wow, that is interesting. 
guys that might have been uh dark waters nine to be honest with you guys that was interesting those springs let's dive deeper i first met him in the early 80s he didn't want his real name or address revealed so we called him dj for dynamo jack he was only a healer he said but he did direct a powerful energy generated from his own body into his patients. He called the energy Chi. He then took our newspaper outside and showed us how Chi can also be used to set things on fire. When he heard we'd shown this footage in public, he was very upset and refused all our future efforts to contact him again. He called me you back didn't to notice the flash in the re camera record? We all have undreamed of powers sleeping within us and that there's nothing special about him except for his training in waking room. I first met him in the early 80s. He didn't want his real... Come on, man. He didn't want us. He got upset when he found out we shared it to the public, but you didn't see the camera record in that flash when you was pyro man in that newspaper. Come on, G. Let's go to the next one. Yes, and that is safety. Here we have one of our cooking units and. I just turned on the gas. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, my mother used to tell me, never, ever, ever do what I just did. Why? Because traditional cooking gas is toxic. If you turn it on like I just did and leave it on, you're going to die. The gas itself will kill you. You have another risk. If you leave the gas on like this and there's a spark, there will be an explosion and the explosion will kill you. So either the gas kills you or the explosion kills you. Either way, you're dead. But with oxygen and hydrogen, it's different. And I'll explain to you why. Right now, the air that we are breathing is oxygen and hydrogen gas mixed with about 70% nitrogen. When this gas mixes with the nitrogen, it doesn't burn. It is possible to reach concentration levels high enough that you will have a flame. But... Even if that happens, this gas is safer, and I'll tell you why. Hydrogen gas is very, very light. So the hydrogen gas that's coming out of here will always rise to the top of the room. So if there is a spark and the concentration levels are high enough, the fire will be up there, not down here. Okay, but let's deal with this right now. The gas has been coming out of this burner head for more than a minute. And this torch is lit. But as you can see, we have no explosion. That's because the gas that comes out of this burner is mixing with the nitrogen that's in the air and causing our fuel to become harmless. Even after a minute, I can hold the flame this close, and there's still no fire, no explosion. If I want to light this burner, I need to get very close. So even after this gas being on for two minutes, more than two minutes, still no explosion, still very safe. This is different from any other gas fuel you have ever used in your home. For cooking, this gas is more efficient 
and cleaner than traditional gas fuels. Uh, it's also much safer. As you can see, this gas can be used exactly like any other cooking gas. But there's no smoke, no pollution, and the flame is more efficient. If you look closely, you can cook with a very small flame, same as you would for any other type of cooking gas. It's very good for heating. Or, if you want, you can have a very large flame. There's the water. This was before it's time. These drawers are just for storage if you want to have pots, pans. As you can see here, we have this meter which tells you how much current is being used by our machine to produce the gas. This is important because all of our machines produce the gas on demand. On demand is very important and I'll tell you why. You see this light just went on. That means that the gas pressure has already been reached and the machine itself has stopped producing gas. Now another thing I want you to look at here I don't know if you can see this, but the water is already boiling. That's how fast this gas will heat. It's very, very efficient. Now let me turn this back on again. And you'll see the water is boiling. Now, this green light just went on here. And this gauge is showing you How much energy is required to produce the gas? When the proper gas pressure is obtained, this light goes out and this yellow light will come on telling you that the gas is no longer being produced by our machine. This is gas on demand. There is no storage of the gas. It is totally on demand. That means no propane tanks, no gas tanks that can explode, no wow. gas tanks that need to be transported from your distributor to your home. It's all here, on demand, gas on demand. Gas, and that is safety. Do you think that stove would be viable even today, or is it just a hoax? find out the truth about this man, the whole world could change. Japanese scientist Masuru Emoto was known to experiment in odd ways, which many of us know some of the most incredible inventions came from very unorthodox practices. In Dr. Emoto's case, he decided to experiment with water because he had an idea that water was actually some sort of conscious entity, very fringe and far out thinking. But what he discovered would shock the world, at least parts of the world that knew that this thing even existed. He would take droplets of water and speak certain things to them and then freeze them and would document the structural integrity of its molecular structure. So when you say positive things to these water droplets, he discovered they would form perfect sacred geometric patterns. But when he spoke negative things to the water droplets, they exhibited chaotic and distorted cellular structures. Now, how could this possibly happen? Water doesn't understand the English or Japanese language. It's not language they're interpreting, but energy. Words carry energy, frequency, and vibration. Have any of you guys heard about that experiment? Looks like a good one. I heard about some type of rice experiment, but I don't know if that was the same one. Water for fuel? No way. They're using water to fuel this vehicle.
Man, with how crazy gas prices is nowadays, man, boy, we could sure use that. Wow. That looks like they took that straight out of an alien ship. Hydrogen energy machine. This is like, it's like an iPhone, right? But we're God's iPhone. We're his favorite creation. It's really, we're the ultimate technology. Sometimes we feel like technology tries to compete with us, but a human has never made anything, never designed anything better than a human. So I think we, have, we gotta focus on humanity. We gotta focus on other human beings. You know, we have to be past the past. We're focused on the future now. And we have to connect with all the inventors and the designers and the engineers, all the people who have ideas of how this world could work because we have more than enough resources for everyone in the world to be happy. There's five resources that the 1% use to control the 99%. That's water, food, education, shelter, and medicine. And everyone can have the best version of that. And that's our promise of what we're doing here. This is an ultra-small electricity generator, is highly portable and works even with shallow, slow-moving water. Weighing just 18 kilograms, this is the first ever generator of its kind, that can be easily carried. This is an ultra-small electricity generator, is highly portable and works even with shallow, slow-moving water. Weighing just 18 kilograms, this is the first ever generator of its kind, that can be easily carried by one person. It's already being used in roadside irrigation channels to power streetlights. There are many places where individuals or whole areas have no access to electricity. It can transform life in remote areas of the world that still lack power. Thanks. Huh? Why would they not do this from the factory? What this gentleman's done here is on a Chevy Bolt, the electric car, he's actually hooked up a generator to the frame and then a pulley system around the wheel. So as the wheels spin, the generator generates electricity and charges the batteries. Oh. What does that do? Well, it eliminates the need for a charging station now. So as he's driving the car using energy, he's putting energy right back into it. As long as that generator puts out the equivalent of what he's using, he'll never need to recharge his batteries. It'll just constantly keep a charge, theoretically speaking, right? So then why wouldn't they do this from the factory? What do you think the reason is why they would not automatically put a generator? My dad had an e-bike years ago that had a generator in the pedals. So as you pedaled it, it recharged the batteries. Well, why would they not do this naturally with a car? I mean, what is your reason why? Huh? Why would they not have a generator already installed to recharge the batteries as you're driving? You blow absolute common sense. Huh? Hey, why would why would they do that? I wonder. That is a great idea. While you're driving, you're generating energy. Man. Huh, that makes you think. The Pierce Arrow electric car. Why have I not heard about this? Powered by pure ethereal electricity? What is that? Ethereal electricity. Does not run on batteries, oil, or gas. It just uses the ions in the air, I guess. Those Taurus fields. I was working with this stuff in the late 1800s and early 20th century. While he was messing with free energy, he and his nephew drove a car powered only by the energy he took out of the air. He had that technology perfected already in 1928. Tesla wanted to give us this technology for free. Now, with Tesla and the electric cars again, people begin to dig around, you know, and find out that Tesla was talking about this stuff 100 years ago. You guys like those trucks? You think those trucks are cool? I like them. I hate to say it, but I think it's tight.
certainly those who lack understanding would think that the pyramids are merely tombs. Throughout the life of the genius Nikola Tesla, he spent nearly 15 years studying the shape, size, and especially the true function of the Egyptian pyramids. The final result he came up with was shocking. The pyramids are actually abandoned energy stations of an ancient civilization. Immediately after that, Tesla attempted to create a grand structure named the Tesla Tower, using the same operating principle as the pyramids to harness energy from Earth's field, creating an almost infinite source of energy. Tesla calculated that just one such tower could generate enough electricity to power a large city for an entire decade. Moreover, it wouldn't even need wires and the electricity generated would be completely free. If successful, this project would propel humanity into the future by 200 years. However, it's unfortunate that his financier at the time, J.P. Morgan, feared that this free electricity source would topple his traditional power supply corporations. Therefore, Morgan abruptly withdrew all capital from the project, causing the Grand Tesla Tower to forever remain one of the greatest regrets of the century. Here's into the future. Try 500. This is a good one, y'all. Y'all see those colors and lights? Wow. Look at how the light's hitting the bottom. They got the parking brake on. Is it opening up? What is that? Hey, that looks low. The yin and yang. that looks so close where are the stars wow 
Oh. These photos are incredible. Wow. Damn. All right, y'all, that's all I got for today. If you made it this far, man, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button and some words of encouragement. You know, it really helps me out. And if you're interested, um i have a memberships available now so you can go ahead and start earning monthly loyalty badges you, you know it shows you how long you've been a member for the channel and it really helps support what i got going over here and i'm trying uh to get some upgrades going and i just want to say thank you to everyone that uh supports this channel it really helps a lot um yeah i'm i'm working i'm very close to finishing what i've been working on and um I'm excited to announce it to everyone and I'm just thankful that uh, I'm on this journey on these waters with all you guys and you know I'm, I'm just extremely appreciative and um, yeah be looking for some live events soon I'm working on getting some lives get together soon you know I got a whole bunch of topics of videos we're going to go over and talk about um, I kind of went uh, you know hit several on this one you know i got several more on the different video i want to cover you guys know how we get down on these dark waters man it's your boy jet ski chuck on these creepy and scary reaction videos i'm out peace out